Welcome to The Reality. Indeed, welcome to The Reality. So good to be with you once again, uh, sharing the story of a life touched and changed for the good, for good by the reality of knowing Jesus Christ. I'm Dudley Anderson, so good to be with you. I'll be giving you my email address a little bit later on today, and if you've heard anything in today's program that's just made sense to you, I would love to hear from you. Today on The Reality, we're going to be speaking to Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. Rabbi Hirschberg was raised an Orthodox Jew in the Bronx in New York City. But though he maintained a healthy fear of God, Greg rebelled against his Orthodox upbringing. In his words, he did the world. Entering the corporate world, he began to make lots and lots of money. In 1989, he got married, and while on honeymoon to Israel, Greg had a vision of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Something was pulling me. I felt like somebody literally was on top of that mountain with a fishing rod and they cast it and the hook went into my heart and running towards this basilica. And so I heard a voice and it said, come away with me and pray. I saw this figure coming out of it and he came down and he pressed himself right against me. First thing he said to me was, I love you. And I never felt anything like that. Well, my pleasure today to have with me on The Reality, Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. Thank you so much, Rabbi, for joining us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Fantastic. Now, you've got an amazing story to to tell of how you found Jesus, Yeshua, as Lord, as Adonai. I want to find out about that. Um, I read that you were quoted as saying, I am a nobody telling everybody about somebody who can change anybody. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Tell us your story. How did you find Jesus? You know, I really didn't find him. He he found me. Mm. And um, I was always very zealous. I was raised Jewish in the Bronx, a, a borough that was known, one of the five boroughs in New York City, as the Jewish borough. After I after I was bar mitzvahed, I just, I just wanted to try the world to emphasize. There was a lot of temptations in the Bronx. There was a lot going on. And um, I just didn't want to really go to synagogue anymore. It, look, I, I don't blame my rabbi or I don't blame the synagogue, but uh, he was no game show host and uh, the service was orthodox. It was in Hebrew. And I just, I, I didn't feel connected. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't. I felt connected to my Judaism from a cultural standpoint where many Jews are today. You know, there's only 14 million Jews in the world. 99.85% of the world's population is non-Jewish. Hmm. And probably 80 to 90% of them are, are cultural. So Judaism is strange. It's it's supposed to be a religion, but it's kind of like a nationality to a lot of Jewish people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if I was hanging out in the Bronx and somebody said, I'm from Irish descent, uh, I'm from German descent, I would always say, I'm, I'm Jewish. <laughs> and so hmm. there's... There's more of a, a nationality attached to it than than a religious focus. Mm-hmm. Well, I I don't know if I became a secular humanist, but uh, because I don't know, God was ingrained in me. I always had this fear, and I don't think you can revere God too much. Mm-hmm. And I think the best way to approach God is on your knees, not jumping in His office and throwing your feet up and slapping Him in the back mm-hmm. and saying, "What's up, pops?" Spot on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think Jesus is a homeboy. I think he's our Lord and Savior. Amen. Absolutely. And I think when you really get a revelation of the cross, and that should happen every day, um, you should lower yourself more and more. Well, I did the world. I uh, my father passed away when I was fifteen. He was a tough guy, but he loved he loved my mom, and um, tough tough as nails, toughest guy. And he raised his kids to be tough. Mm. And you had to be a little tough in the Bronx to kind of survive. He wanted, he was living vicariously through me. So he wanted me to go to college. He wanted me to make something of myself. So I did. Went to college. I got a scholastic scholarship to college. I got hired by an, uh, uh, one of the biggest international consulting and auditing firms in the world. I worked there for a while. I, I left there, opened up my own company, executive search firm. I was making money. Yeah, I was like a little impressed with myself. I, I I also was like, hey, dad, you know, I'd look up and go, how am I doing? Mm-hmm. I was still trying to please him. So um, I married this. You can imagine I was uh, I used to be I used to be decent looking. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I don't know. So uh, <laughs> I married the swimsuit model. Uh-huh. Uh, so the two of us young, um, you know, in great shape, money. 
I was supposed to go on a honeymoon to the Caribbean. That's where we wanted to go. We were we were partiers. You know, we drank too much and partied too much, and that's who we were. Mm-hmm. And um, I met somebody on the train, and they said, going into the city, and they said, have you ever thought about going to Israel? And I was like, what? I said, no, no, I have no desire to go to Israel. And she said, well, you know, my father-in-law has a travel agency in New York. He can help you with that. He does exclusive travel to Israel. Okay. Took the number. Then the next day, a friend of mine, I was involved in martial arts, my Kung Fu instructor said, I think you need to go to Israel for your honeymoon. Anyway, it was it was becoming evident that I needed to go. There was something that God does. Mm-hmm. It's like a pre-conversion, if you will. Mm-hmm. And you look back and it's hindsight. You see how he was putting everything in place for you to cave, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. for you to just become undone. Mm-hmm. And um, I was confident that Israel was going to be a lousy vacation and a lousy honeymoon that I put the Greek Isles on the end. So 10 days in Israel, seven days in the Greek Isles, and I couldn't wait to get to Greece. <laughs> Went to Israel, started in Alat. Alat is in the southern peninsula. It's on the Red Sea. It's a party place. So I was at home. We were going out. We were dancing. We were water skiing. I was scuba diving in Egypt. I was like, okay, you know, Greggy likes this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then we went to Jerusalem after that. And I didn't like Jerusalem at all. There was something very oppressive there. Uh, the little, little city is cut up in four corners. You know, you've got a Jewish quarter, a Muslim quarter. You've got an, uh, an Armenian quarter and a Christian quarter. And sadly enough, they don't get along at all. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like the stress of it. I don't like fighting. You know, when I see people fight it, it disturbs me. So it was the last day, um, and I said to Bernard that I said, look, it's our last day here before we go to Greece. Let's go up north. It's a very small country. It's like an hour and a half ride. Let's just get a car and go up north. Got a car, went up north. She said, where do you want to go? I said, I don't know. I, I heard about this place called the Transfiguration Mount. <laughs> so it's a lot of, 1989, a lot of people are hitchhiking, soldiers hitchhiking. I'm picking them up. And I'm like, well, do you know where the Transfiguration Mount is? And, the, you know, they didn't really speak much English, so they, they really didn't know. One soldier said, can you give me a ride? I said, where? He said, Tabor. I didn't know that Mount Tabor is the Transfiguration Mount. Mm-hmm. The Bible calls it the Transfiguration Mount because that's where Jesus transfigured, right? But it's it's correctly called Mount Tabor. So I dropped him off and I looked to my left and there was this mountain. And I, look, I don't know how to describe this. I, I never shared this with anybody because I thought people would think I'm cuckoo. Mm-hmm. So I just didn't. Plus, it was very sacred to me. It was the most sacred thing I've ever experienced. So something was pulling me. I explained it to people like I felt like somebody literally was on top of that mountain with a fishing rod and they cast it and the hook went into my heart and they were ferociously reeling me up. So I began driving like a maniac, which people in New York do, but especially like a maniac. And I remember burning that my wife yelling and, you know, she doesn't yell. Tough, tough, tough chick. (laughs) She doesn't yell. (laughs) And I got up to the top, and I remember opening up the car door in the parking lot and running towards this basilica, this this little building, if you will. And on the plaque, it said the Basilica of the Transfiguration. And, um, yeah, I got very emotional, kind of as I am now. Mm-hmm. I, I hate telling the story because... It just overwhelms me. And um, I heard a voice, and I know people have a hard time with that too, but I mean, I I could see the world having a hard time with it. I get the world. I was in it 30 years. But how do Christians have a hard time with hearing somebody say they heard God's voice when all throughout the Bible everybody heard God's voice? Hmm. I mean, just because they don't hear it doesn't mean he's not talking. And so I heard a voice and it said, come away with me and pray. And it was said, I really didn't know how to pray. There's a lot of rote prayers I learned when I was young, but I didn't know how to communicate really with God. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't know what to do. So I was involved in a lot of the Eastern thought and Eastern meditation. So I found the quiet place where nobody was. I climbed this three tier rock. I closed my eyes and I tried to empty myself. That's all I understood 
about prayer and meditation. As I did, I went into somewhat of a trance. Obviously, there's a lot of Christians will have a problem with trance, but uh, it says, the Bible says in Acts 10, that Peter went up to the roof and praying, he went into a trance. In Acts 22, it said, Paul went into a trance. So those are two giants. And if you look up the word, it means ecstasy in the Greek, obviously, New Testament language. Mm-hmm. And it's a throwing off of the mind. And you think you're seeing with your bodily eyes and bodily ears what God is showing you within. And I saw the eastern sky open up. And um, um, I saw this figure coming out of it and started to transcend. Jesus. And um, his face. It was so bright, it shone like the sun. Wow. And the rest of him as white as light. And he came down and he pressed himself right against me, chest to chest. Wow. And I couldn't really see his face because it was too, the light was too bright. First thing he said to me was, I love you. And I never felt anything like that. I was loved by my dad and my mom. I was loved by my sisters. I was loved by Bernadette. I was loved by my nieces and nephews, but this was otherworldly. And then he said, I'm the one you're reading about in the Old Testament. I always was. I don't understand it, but all of a sudden I believed that he was who he was, who he said he was. And I was crying. I remember I was overwhelmed. And I was burning that, you know, with street people. She said, what the hell's going on? (laughs) And I could not speak. And I cried for a very long time. Bernadette says it was like 15, 20 minutes. And as I look back, you know, tears are usually tears of joy or tears of sadness, usually. This wasn't either. It was tears of like sanctification. It was like I was being cleansed. Mm -hmm. All the Eastern thought, all the religion, all my crazy little beliefs and my philosophies was leaving me. And he came in. And he's been in ever since. Wow. Fantastic. And um, I didn't understand what you understand and what believers understand about the housing of the Holy Spirit in our tabernacles. I never read the New Testament. So Bernadette said, Greg, Let's go. And I said, I'm not going, Burn. I mean, I know it sounds like I was out of my mind, but it does say you need to get the mind of Christ, right? So, and the Bible does say it's really bad to be double minded. So you got to lose your mind to get his. That's the bottom line. Hmm. And I said, I'm not going. She says, you, You're kidding me, right? And I said, No, Burn. She goes, What do you mean? I said, Burn, I've done a lot of things and been a lot of places, but I've never felt this euphoric feeling. And I'm afraid to leave it. I don't want to leave it. It feels too good. It's better than any high I've ever had. And she said some choice words that I won't use. (laughs) But she said, we got to get back and pack. We're going to Greece in the morning. So I said, give me a minute. And she walked away towards the car. And I said, God, I'm really sorry. I don't want to leave. (laughs) But looks like I have to, right? So I'll be back one day. But I came home and everything changed, man. I gave my company to my partner. He said, we, what are you doing? I said, we got to see lawyers. I said, I don't, there's goodwill involved. I don't care. I don't want anything. Uh, my mother thought I lost my mind. Uh, others did. I had to get away from my house and my friends like Abraham did move to Florida. And I became a witnessing machine. I just wanted everybody and anybody to know about this great Lord and Savior I have and this great Father I have. A lot of zeal, not much knowledge. Yeah. But yeah, it's been a wild ride. And ever since then, you know, God pulled me into ministry and I've traveled to 50 countries and had the honor, you know, and the privilege of sharing the gospel all over. Praise God. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. 
Greg, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We're going to take a little break and be back after this. You're listening to The Reality, produced by Sheer Reality. Listen again at sheerreality.net. This is a listener-supported radio ministry, and we depend on you, the listener, to help us produce these programs, touching lives around the world. To become a vision partner of Sheer Reality, go to sheerreality.net and click on Become a Vision Partner. That is, become a vision partner at sheerreality.net. You're listening to The Reality with me, Dudley Anderson, a half-hour talk show talking about the reality of Jesus Christ. Well, as we've been chatting today with Rabbi Greg Hirschberg, perhaps you've heard something that's raised a question or two in your heart, in your mind. Or perhaps you have some comments or you need some prayer. I would love to hear from you. Write to me by email at dudley at surereality.net. That is dudley at surereality.net. I would love to hear from you. Well, today we're talking with Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. He shared how he grew up in the Bronx of New York City in an Orthodox Jewish home. Greg had no interest in following his parents' religion. When he grew up, he took on a more humanist view of life. Soon he found himself in business, making copious amounts of money in the corporate world. In 1989, Greg got married. He and his wife went to Israel for their honeymoon. Still with no understanding of the leading of the Holy Spirit or any of the New Testament scriptures, Greg found himself visiting Mount Tabor, the Mount of Transfiguration, up north in Israel. Feeling compelled to ascend this mountain, Greg had an intense vision of Jesus when Jesus told him that he loved him. Greg was overwhelmed by the love of God, and his life was radically changed for the good, for good, by the reality of coming to know Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ. We continue to talk with Rabbi Greg today via Skype. I asked him to tell us if he had any knowledge of the Christian scriptures and the Mount of Transfiguration before this experience. Somebody told me about it. I mean, I was, you know, growing up, people say, what did, what did, what did the Jews believe about Jesus? Well, I tell them, ask two Jews, get three opinions. Everybody has Mm. a different, even in Christianity, everybody's got a slightly different theology, if you will. Mm. Um, I try to, you know, focus on the majors and not get caught up in minutia. I've studied and studied and studied, and I could spin somebody's head with knowledge, but why? Mm. Why when it's so, you know, it's so simple. The parables were so simple. The teachings were so simple. I tell Christians all the time, believe as Messianic Jews, whatever you want to call yourself, you're supposed to emulate the Messiah. So spend your time getting to know him hmm. and then play follow the leader. It's not that hard. Hmm. God so loved the world. He loves people. And if you're going to be God-like, Christ-like, you've got to figure out how. So because you struggle with loving your neighbors yourself, you want to get into eschatology. You want to talk about the rapture. You want to talk about the 144,000. We can, but we don't really know the time and the hour. That's why he, when the disciples were like, when are you coming back? And he's like, forget that. I've got something more immediate at hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Rabbi, amazing. What an amazing story. So uh, you came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, as um, a Messianic believer would say, Yeshua Hamashiach. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, Messianic uh, belief or or Messianic believers. Um, I believe that uh, the original uh, terminology was Hebrew Christians. The word Christian, in fact, was formed by the Romans. It's not it's not a Gentile religious phrase. Um, Tell us a little bit about Orthodox Judaism and how they view Christians. Well, you know, the actual in the first century, it was called the way. Yes, it's right in the book of. Acts, because Acts. you said, I'm the way. There's no other way. <laughs> like, I'm not one of many. I'm the only. Yes, indeed. So it was called the way. Mm-hmm. And those guys were, were Jewish. And they were still going in the temple. I don't know where, what people think. They didn't form a church. They were 12 Jewish guys who maintained Judaism because Judaism isn't the problem. Judaism isn't necessarily the answer. Sin is the problem, and Jesus is the answer. Mm-hmm. Jesus mm-hmm. never told the boys to give up their Judaism. Paul mm-hmm. said, I am a Pharisee in the book of Acts. Not I was, mm-hmm. 
But this is something the enemy wanted terribly to detract and vacuum out anything Jewish from the faith. Mm. Distorted. Because it's it's a distortion, isn't it? It's it's uh, not good because you know. So from, from my down. from my point of view, um, Orthodox, particularly Orthodox Judaism, views Christianity as Gentile, but it's not. It's Jewish. Uh, Christianity is Jewish, and and Christians often view Jews as another religion, but it's not another religion. We are of the same faith. We believe in the same God, are we not? It's, there's a connection here. The problem is that sometimes we don't know our enemy's modus operandi. And God said from the beginning, I'll make the two one. So the enemy does the antithesis. I'll make the one two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good point. He yeah. wants us to divorce ourselves from everything. So when the middle wall came down and there was a wall on the temple, there was a court of Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Sadly enough, a lot of the Jews looked at them as, you know, pagan hedonists, which they were. But Paul spoke about the wall is taken down. Hmm. Now there's no Jew or Gentile. We're one. So what do I do if I'm Satan? I got to rebuild the wall. (laughs) Hmm. I got to do all I can to divide this because this is not good. Jesus said to the Jewish people, when you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he, meaning when you recognize me as Messiah, that's one more Baruch haba to me returning. You won't see me again until you say. He was speaking to the religious Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So Satan wants to keep them blind. Mm -hmm. And how does he keep them blind? By separating Judaism and Christianity. And how? Okay, you guys, you're Saturday. (laughs) You guys, you're Sunday. (laughs) You guys are first fruits. You guys are Easter. (laughs) <laughs> you guys stay away from, from ham. Yeah. You guys eat ham till it's coming out of your ears. And you have separation. <laughs> yes. So Jewish people look at Christianity and they go, I, look, they seem like nice people. I don't want anything bad to happen to them. But you have nothing to do with us and we have nothing to do with you. And that's what my mom told me. My mom said, look, you're Jewish. Yeah. Their guy is Jesus. He's not a bad guy. Yeah. I don't really know much about him, son, but he's not our guy. Our guy is Moses. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's Jude- – you ask any theologian who, who's worth anything, it's Judeo-Christianity. Yeah, you yeah. know, the Ivy League schools in America, they teach religion. These guys wouldn't know Jesus if they fell over him, right? They're not born again. But at least they know two-thirds of their Bible is Jewish. Mm-hmm. The first 12 were Jewish. Mm-hmm. The next 3,000 were Jewish. The tens of thousands in Acts 21 were Jewish. Why? Because why would a pagan Gentile – come to Jerusalem to celebrate a Jewish feast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That doesn't mean it's exclusive, but the first convert was Cornelius. Yeah, 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 yeah. And God was opening up the door. He was filling the Abrahamic covenant. Yeah, absolutely. He was saying, Peter, this is not going to be an exclusive Jewish club. And in this kingdom, I don't care if you're male or female. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're black or white. I don't care if your heritage is Irish or Italian. I could care less. I couldn't care less. You're now a believer. Now, Mm. the world has these differences. How are we going to know the kingdom of heaven if we don't know the kingdom of darkness? Mm. We need the contrast. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how how do you have Christianity without Judaism? I don't harp on it. I don't make a federal case about it. My focus is Jesus. Amen. It is messianic Judaism. The Messiah comes before my religion. Yeah, messianic Christianity. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it it gets, people want to fight over things. Listen, Dudley, it gets so technical, right? So so the Baptists say you've got to dunk, you've got to immerse. (laughs) And if you don't immerse fully, if you don't fully immerse, then it's then it's they throw the penalty flag. Now I could argue with them if I want, but I don't want to argue. Yeah. I can say, you know, the Bible says it's Mayim Chaim, living waters. Yeah. So your tank in the church is inappropriate. Yeah. But no, it's it's water. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's water. It doesn't matter if you dip, dunk, drip, it's water. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just something, an outward manifestation of what you're proclaiming that's hopefully happened on the inside. Yes, indeed. Just a, a, a time is nearly up, uh, Rabbi. I want to just ask you a question about revival. You know, um, in the book of Acts from chapter 2 on, in fact, the Acts, it's called the Acts of the Apostles, but in fact, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. From the, the book, from the second chapter of Acts, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There was a great revival in Jerusalem. Do you believe we're going to have another revival in Jerusalem? The book of Exodus says that the firstborn, which Israel was the firstborn, gets a double portion of the inheritance. So it started in Jerusalem, in the city. They filled the city with the gospel in less than a year. 
It moved into the region of Judea, then Samaria, and then it went to the outermost parts of the world, which it's still going to. Hmm. If you look at the trajectory when when Paul was going east, the Holy Spirit arrested him and told him to go west to Macedonia. Um, it's been going west ever since. Hmm. It went into Europe. Europe sent out missionaries all over the world. It hit the Americas, first North America, then South America, and then it went into Africa, and then it went into Asia, and right now, if you look at it, it's still going east into the Muslim countries. Hmm. Muslims are getting saved, hmm. and they're getting saved miraculously. If you ask 100 Americans in a room, how did you get saved, was it miraculous, They nobody would raise their hand. And then if you were with 100 Muslims who got saved, how many got saved with signs and visions? All 100 hands would go up. Mm-hmm. So where's, where's the last stop on this Holy Spirit revival train? Jerusalem. Yeah, absolutely. That's East, 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 East Jerusalem. And why are they going to get a double portion? They're the firstborn. Joel still has to be filled. It's the Lord double reference. Yeah. He said, all your sons and daughters will prophesy. That didn't happen in the first century, just some. It's going to happen again. Praise the God. greatest revival that has been known to man is going to happen. All the nations are going to surround little Israel as they're surrounding her now. Hmm. They're going to try to annihilate her, which they've, you know, the enemies always wanted to, get rid of that witness. And Jesus is going to come back and fight for her like on a day of battle. The line of Judah is going to roar like never before. And a third are going to come through the fire. We were impressed with 3,000 getting saved. How about 5 million getting mm-hmm. saved in a Come moment? Bring them on. Absolutely. Fantastic. It's happening. It's so happening. what we need, as opposed to like, uh, you know, people ask me, is America going to see a revival? I don't know. Maybe, man. I don't know. I'm not a prognosticator. But I'll tell you what. Maybe you need a revival. Yeah. Maybe instead of looking for national revival, mm-hmm. we should look for personal individual revival. Re- revival starts here. Yeah, let God worry right about here. what he's My going to heart. do in the nations. Come Make on. sure your heart's revived. Spot on. Rabbi Greg Hirschberg, it was wonderful chatting with you today on The Reality. Thank you so much for your time. Pray God's blessing as you continue to serve him where he calls you. And really my pleasure today to have spoken to Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. If you'd like to know more about Greg and his ministry, please visit the website BethYeshuaInternational.org. That's BethYeshuaInternational.org. Well, thank you so much for your company today. Just to remind you, I'd love to hear from you. Please email me, Dudley, at ShareReality.net. The Reality is produced by Sure Reality, a listener-supported radio ministry. With your prayer and financial support, we could produce these programs to touch lives around the world. Please consider partnering with us by becoming a vision partner at surereality.net. From me, that to you, as always, keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless.